Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He worked on Wall Street for many years as an award-winning investment analyst and has co-authored two books over the years. His first book was The Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It, Make a Fortune by Investing in Gold and Other Hard Assets, written in 2008, co-authored by James Turk. And his second book, which came out, I think, in 2014, is The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. John Rubino, thank you for joining me. Hey, Jason. Good to talk to you again. It's been quite a while. Um, I hope all is well. Yeah, just grinding out a living here, making uh, making long YouTube videos and writing research articles on my Patreon <laughs> about the crazy global macro conditions going on. Yeah, no shortage of material, huh? Oh, yeah. It seems like the rules change almost daily. <laughs> So um, with that in mind, I want to ask you some global macro related questions. Um, my first question, what do you think are the biggest risks to the global economy right now? Boy, there are so many. Uh, you know, I, I'm quite a bit older than you, but uh, you, you've been around for a while, too. So has, has there ever been a time in your experience in your experience when there were this many big risks out there? You know, this many things that could go wrong, it could mess everything up. Um, that is, this is uh, unique for me. I've never seen a world that has this many potential crises all waiting to happen at once. But if you may, if maybe tease one out of this mess, I, I would say it's the energy thing. Um, and especially in Europe right now, um, Europe made a, a series of energy related mistakes. And you know, the, the modern economy depends on energy. You have to have cheap electricity and uh, cheap gasoline to function right now. And Europe has neither. Um, you know, they, they basically tried to accelerate the transition to renewable energy before those technologies were ready. They closed down their nuclear plants. They closed down their their coal burning plants. They um, made themselves dependent on Russian natural gas. And then um, they went out and they antagonized Russia by trying to expand NATO right up to Russia's borders and kind of forcing Putin into finally doing something militarily. And then they slapped sanctions on Russia. And now the natural gas that they were counting on is cut off. And um, in some European countries, electricity is now 10 times as expensive as it was a year ago. Um, in Germany, they're telling people, you know, see if you can find some firewood and, uh, and instead of taking a shower, um, wash off with a wet towel. <laughs> and in other places, they're saying, you know, don't charge your electric car if you can help it. It's, it's an incredible mess heading into the winter when, uh, you know, people are going to freeze to death if this keeps up or, um, or they're at least going to be bankrupted by electricity bills that are 10 times as high as what they were paying a year ago. Um, and, you know, Europe is a massive economic entity. And for it to be heading into this kind of a crisis guarantees reverberations around the world. And that's just Europe. You know, you've got uh, Japan where the, um, the yen is tanking right now, which is very inflationary. Um, and they, they really have no solution because they borrowed so much money when they should have been building up reserves against a, a rapidly aging population. So, you know, Japan is functionally bankrupt. Um, and then, of course, you've got the geopolitics out there and everything of Russia and Ukraine and, and uh, the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, energy is going to be front page news for at least the next year. And most of that news is going to be bad. Um, and I, I think the, the epicenter of it is Europe, but it could spread around the world. And Japan has to import tons of energy, too. So you have the European Union, the United Kingdom, Japan, other parts of Asia emerging markets all trying to compete for natural gas and liquefy natural gas. And then, and then there's a finite amount of natural gas exports that can be delivered to these countries. And I think emerging markets are the party that's missing out. They're the ones that are supposed to have gotten these uh, um, these natural gas and liquefied natural gas shipments. And instead it's being diverted to the European Union and the prices are still sky high. Yeah, the emerging markets are, uh, you know, a separate, but almost a scary story because um, first of all, a lot of those guys borrowed um, a lot of money in U.S. dollars um, on the assumption that uh, their currency would hold up versus the dollar. But that that hasn't happened in, in you know, the global crisis. The, the dollar is up versus most of the emerging market currencies, which makes dollar denominated debt much harder to pay off 
which makes those guys even less financially stable than they were. And you're seeing civil unrest all around the world. But um, the, the biggest part of it is in emerging markets where a, a huge percent of the percentage of the population is already just getting by. OK, they can cover rent, food and gasoline. And that's it. Now you make the gasoline go way up and you make the food go way up. And all of a sudden, they're having to decide whether to pay their rent for this month and risk um, being homeless if they don't or feed their children. And uh, people in that kind of situation take to the streets frequently. And you're seeing that happen all around the world. Even Iraq, Iraq right now is apparently um, looking at a civil war and the U.S. is evacuating people from the green zone there and stuff. You know, that was our big multi-trillion dollar nation building project there. And uh, along with Afghanistan, which is gone. Um, Iraq looks like it's heading the same way. So, um, you know, we've tossed a lot, a lot of money at, at things that didn't work. Um, but yeah, the, um, the emerging market crisis is dangerous on a lot of levels. And one of which is that, uh, a, a lot of the emerging markets are sources of raw materials. They, they export a lot of the raw materials that the developed world needs. Uh, and you, um, throw them into political and economic chaos, which, breaks those supply chains and the rest of us suffer from that uh, even more than we are now. So um, th there are so many self-reinforcing feedback loops now out there where, um, you know, one thing makes the feedback loop wor worse, which makes makes it even worse over here. And it just keeps on going. And, and that's kind of what we're seeing, where one thing feeds into another thing which then feeds back into the first thing, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. And the, the emerging markets are a pretty good example of that. Yeah, there's a lot of problems in emerging markets, a lot of different cross currents. You brought up dollar denominated debt. The dollar index right now, we're recording this interview on Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. The dollar index is at 108.7. It is very, very high, especially against emerging market currencies, against the euro and the Japanese yen. But these emerging markets are dealing, not only are they dealing with falling commodity prices, except for food and energy, so the raw materials that they export, the prices might be lower, but there's already supply chain problems that are going to be made worse. You have people protesting in the streets, like you said, over higher food, energy, electricity, gasoline, diesel, all these prices are up. The supply chain, uh, they're wanting higher wages. So you have inflation already in the cost structure, the supply chain, commodity prices are going down, potentially in a recession or depression, people could lose their jobs. It does not look good on the supply side for commodities. But I guess what the deflationistas would say is that uh, the higher dollar and the recession would cause demand destruction though. What, it, what are your views on demand destruction? Oh yeah, I think that's coming in, in a big way because um, already, um, the U.S. economy is slowing. Let's just talk about the U.S. for a second. We're, we're seeing big layoffs being announced by a lot of major companies. Um, house prices have peaked and are rolling over. So the housing market, which was a, a full-on bubble six months ago, um, is now looking like it might turn into a bust in the coming year. Um, you've got Falling prices, as you said, for a lot of industrial commodities, which they, they were inflationary and now they're falling, so that's deflationary. Um, so it, it's looking like the U.S. could easily fall from you know, the inflationary boomlet that we've had lately into um, a modest recession without much else going wrong, just by the, the momentum of what's, uh, what's happening in the economy today. Um, and part of that is because uh, the, the dollar is so strong relative to other currencies, which, you know, since, since I um, am the co-author of a book called The Coming Collapse of the Dollar, it, it, we, we should address the fact that the dollar is crazy strong uh, right now, according to um, some measures. And, the, you know, the answer to this is that um, there are two ways to measure a currency. One is to measure it versus other currencies. And by that measurement, the dollar is is doing really well. And that's because the rest of the world is an even bigger mess than the U.S. So if you're in China or to an extent Russia or Brazil or certainly Europe right now, um, you don't like the chances of holding on to your money if you stay within that system. But if you buy a Miami condo or or some farmland out in Montana or someplace like that, um, you, you've got a better chance of keeping your wealth. So a lot of money is flowing into the U.S. from the rest of the world. That pushes up the exchange rate of the dollar, makes the dollar look relatively strong. 
But at the same time, the better way of, of judging the value or the strength of a currency is its purchasing power. And by that measure, the dollar has lost 10% of its purchasing power just in the last year. You know, we're in a full on, um, well, I don't want to call it a crash, but uh, 10% inflation, in other words, 10% devaluation of the currency is a major crisis for that currency. And uh, that's what the U.S. did in the last year. And it's completely conceivable that between an energy crisis and, you know, food supply chain breakdowns around the world, um, that the dollar continues to lose value, maybe not at a 10% a year rate, but it's going to continue to fall in value versus the things you buy with it. In other words, it's going to learn pur lose purchasing power. So we will have the, the prospect of the dollar going up versus the euro and the yen, but down versus all the real stuff that you buy with it over the next few years, um, which is, I, I think if you're looking at it honestly and rationally, you would say that the dollar is losing value. So I think that's that's what we're headed for. And that's virtually unavoidable if the Fed continues to tighten, you know, they could switch gears right now and start loosening again, start pumping a bunch of money back into the system. And, uh, and we would go back to inflation across the board, but um, they're probably not going to do that. They're probably going to try to tighten as much as is necessary to get inflation under control. And they're going to risk blowing up the uh, global financial system in the process. So uh, I think that's, you know, energy being the big risk. The second biggest risk that we're looking at out there is uh, central banks over tightening in an attempt to get inflation under control and blowing up the leverage speculating community. Uh, and that's a good chance that's going to happen, too, because the, the Fed has made it clear. In fact, uh, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, just last week made a speech in which he said, uh, yeah, you know, in, inflation is our thing now. We're not worried about uh, financial stability. We're not worrying, worried about full employment or anything. We are going to get inflation under control. And that's going to mean pain for the financial markets and for workers and for consumers. So, you know, I think the year ahead and, and the stock market is reacting to that, as you would expect. Stocks have been down for the last three days and uh, very big in the first day of those the three and then modestly down the next couple. Um, and the financial markets, by selling off, are saying, OK, maybe we got it wrong about the Fed pivoting right away. You know, maybe the Fed is actually going to stick with this anti-inflation thing for longer than we thought. Um, and if they do, you know, there's no real way to um, to generate or to engineer a soft landing with this much debt. We are massively over indebted in the U.S. and in the rest of the world. And if we're going to try to dramatically slow down the global economy to get inflation under a 2% target at the same time that all the big supply chains out there are broken, which means much higher prices just to, you know, get something from here to there. Uh, you know, that's messy. It's not going to be able to, uh, to be done easily. And it's completely possible that we, we end up within a year or two in something that looks like 2008, 2009. In other words, a, a recession verging on a depression. Only this time we won't have the tools to fix it because um, interest rates are already pretty low. Um, the, the debt of every major entity just about out there in the world is outrageously high. And, and uh, you know, they, they um, can't take on huge new amounts of debt without really putting themselves at risk. So uh, I, I think what's coming is going to be familiar on the one hand, because it's going to look like 2008, 2009, but very unfamiliar in a scary way, because we will lack the tools this time around to fix what we were kind of sort of able to fix during the Great Recession. Or you get something similar to the 2019 repo madness crisis, because the, one of the main reasons that that happened was because of the leverage speculators at hedge funds and family offices, portfolio managers at investment banks had all these over leveraged trades on stocks, bonds, currencies, derivatives. And then the Fed was reducing their balance sheet. The Fed was raising interest rates then. There was a rate hiking cycle then. So they're going to potentially repeat a lot of the same mistakes of 2018, 2019, leading up to the repo madness crisis. And we found out from the New York Fed disclosures that have come out that the blog website Wall Street on Parade is tracking 
the mainstream financial media isn't tracking it, that there was tens of trillions in hidden bailouts to Japanese investment banks, European banks in 2019 and also in 2020. There's always secret bailouts now. <laughs> we find out this years later uh, when everybody's forgotten that there was even a crisis and they're not paying attention to the size of the bailouts because trillions no longer matter as a, a conceptual thing for people who are paying attention to finance. So, um, yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we had another um, repo-related crisis, but it would just be one of many next time around because the everything bubble has five or six potential potential big crises they're just waiting to happen you know you could see for instance chinese real estate which we haven't even talked about yet but that that alone is enough to throw the world into uh, some kind of a crisis and the um, japanese government debt is a nightmare waiting to happen europe um geez I, you know what's happening in germany right now is just astounding that was the, that was the country that had its act together and um and now it's uh, it might be the front page news crisis of the uh, next few years. Yeah, I didn't um, get a chance to bring it up when you brought up the European Union and energy, but I think there's like all these knock on effects we didn't get a chance to talk about. So these bad energy policies in Germany, you brought up the German consumer and rationing, but it's German manufacturers. So the German economy was an export powerhouse. And now there are electricity costs for German manufacturers. I'm just seeing news stories that German manufacturers are either going to be shutting down or drastically reducing production. I mean, at some point, it looks like a lot of these firms are going to need bailouts, are going to go begging the government, the German government for bailouts. And then on top of that, these firms, uh, these manufacturing companies, don't they owe debt to the European banks? So the German banks like Deutsche Bank and then Credit Suisse and these other large European banks throughout the European Union. So then the banks are going to be in trouble because these large manufacturers don't have the cash flows to pay off or service their debts. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, to take one or two steps back to set the stage for this, the only reason the euro has been a functioning currency is that everyone really thinks of it as a German currency. They assume Germany is backing up you know, Italian debt and Spanish debt and French debt. Um, so they're they're looking at as a as a looking at the euro as a German currency and valuing it accordingly. Now, if Germany blows up, um, you know what what's backing the euro? Is it the Italian economy? <laughs> you know, and there, there's nothing. You know, there's no reason to own the euro. Uh, certainly not as a reserve currency. Um, if you can't count on Germany to be financially stable enough to bail out whoever needs to be bailed out. And uh, what, what you just sketched out there is, um, is a world in which Germany no longer functions as the backstop of the euro. So, yeah, we could see a, a massive currency crisis for the euro in which it just plunges in value. And, uh, and the weakest countries in the eurozone have to leave. Either they have to leave or they voluntarily leave because they can't function under that kind of a system anymore. So, so you see a breakup where um, Italy and Greece and, and maybe Spain go their own ways, go back to their own currencies, and the remaining countries try to um, try to reestablish the euro as a viable currency and without any real guarantee because it already just blew up in our faces, right? So uh, I, how seen, easy is it gonna be? I've seen some energy analysts speculate that the Euro may blow up because these countries would then renegotiate energy deals for cheaper natural gas and oil back with Russia because the US is telling the European Union, if you stay in the European Union, you can't do that. You have to adhere to the sanctions that the US government wants and those sanctions have backfired on the US uh, miserably. Yeah, uh, Europe, well, yes and no in terms of the Europe relationship, European relationship with the U.S. Because on the one hand, um, there's that video that's everywhere now about Trump <clears throat> at the U.N. trying to talk the Europeans out of becoming dependent on Russian natural gas and the German delegation just laughing at him. So we kind of tried to um, steer them away from one of their big mistakes. Uh, meanwhile, though, as the, the main power in NATO, the U.S. has been the driving force in expanding NATO all the way up to Russia's borders and starting this whole mess in, in Ukraine, which in turn um, led to the energy crisis. So, um, you know, there, it, it's reasonable to assume that the Europeans are not at all happy with um, U.S. policy right now because <laughs> we kind of got them into this but, mess. But, to isn't, yeah. but John, isn't the European Union 
and the European Central Bank. I mean, you wrote about this in the money bubble. You talked about the US dollar currency swaps. I know I've spoken to you in emails about this in the past and you've researched this. The European Central Bank, the large European banks, they've been on life support really since 2008, 2009, getting US dollar emergency currency swap lines, these emergency loans, US dollars to save themselves from bad loans to other banks and um, companies and then also bad derivatives bets. And then the Federal Reserve just waves the loans. The European Central Bank and these large um, European banks don't even have to pay back the loans. So um, do you think that that's going to continue or, th or is there some type of a limit to these currency swap lines that the Fed gets uh, cannot get away with anymore? They, they can keep doing all this stuff as long as the currencies they're doing it with um, are considered to be valuable. And as soon as those currencies start to lose value, then the central banks of the world lose the tools with which they normally manipulate markets. And um, you, you can make the case that that's what's happening right now. The major currencies of the world are losing value at an accelerating rate. And if that goes on a little bit longer, um, they won't have the tools that they need to bail out the next batch of big bankruptcies. So yeah, it's completely possible that um, that that we could do a, another wave of bailouts right now. But it's also possible that if the rate our currencies are falling, uh, that would be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, we, when we come out with another multi-trillion dollar bailout, um, and then all of a sudden the, uh, the foreign exchange value of the, uh, the euro and the yen and the dollar start to crater versus the currencies of countries that aren't making these huge mistakes and certainly against real stuff, you know, when, when uh, the price of real things starts to soar, which is to say the value of the currencies you're trying to buy that real stuff with go down, um, then it's game over. Well, and we've already, haven't we, we've already had asset price inflation, especially in the U.S. relative to other countries for decades. I mean, the Cantillon effect, the waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse, the insiders in D.C. and the banks, the corporations here in the United States, they've gotten just unbelievable amounts, trillions of artificially cheap currency and credit to buy back shares and boost their asset prices. Yeah, we've had raging inflation. See, it, it, it hasn't been a zero inflation world um, in the recent past. It's been very inflationary, but the inflation has been, or the price increases, have been limited to financial assets, stocks, bonds, and real estate, which People don't really see that as a devaluing currency. They see it as the stuff they own going up. Which I'm rich. They yeah. think of as good. Yeah, exactly. The wealth, but really, what, it the wealth effect, yeah. Yeah, but really what it is is the currency plunging versus those things. Um, now that that currency depreciation is starting to spread out to different sectors of the um, the global economy besides stocks, bonds, and real estate. And so we're all starting to notice it now. You know, it's always been going on, but now it's, you know, in the Costco meat section and at the gas station and pretty much anywhere else you want to um, look, um, your expenses are going way up. It's getting much, much harder to pay your bills. And so people are now noticing that the world's currencies are being depreciated at an accelerating rate, whereas before um, they were still being depreciated aggressively, but we didn't notice or we didn't care. Now we care. And that that is a huge psychological change because once people kind of internalize the idea of a depreciating currency and they start to think it's permanent, then they start acting accord accordingly. They start front-running it. Uh, which is to say they panic by everything in sight. And that makes it even worse. You know, that makes the prices go up for everything that people are panic buying, and which is to say the value of the currency goes down even faster. And there's a there's a point of no return in that process where you just can't get out of it once it starts. Um, and the in the Austrian School of Economics, they call that the crack up. You know, that's that's basically the end of the functionality of a currency. It just collapses because people lose faith in it. And the reason the Fed is sounding so serious right now about controlling inflation is that they see that they're kind of um, staring into the abyss of a crack up boom right now. And th they want to make it very clear that they're not going to let it happen. So now the question is, can they stop it? You know, at, at, when, when we're this far in, is there anything monetary or fiscal or any other kind of policy can do to stop this thing from just spiraling out of control? And, and who knows? We'll see.
well, if the Fed keeps raising interest rates and the Fed causes a recession, well, we're already in a recession, but if the Fed causes like a longer depression, I mean, politicians are going to get voted out of office. And then the politicians, the people in power in DC are going to start putting pressure on the Fed to stop fighting inflation, even though they caused the inflation in the first place to stop raising interest rates and fighting inflation. So I think there will be political pressure in the probably next six, 12 months if the real economy continues to get worse, telling the Fed, look, you can't let asset prices crash more. Government finances are getting bad. You're destroying the economy. Firms are firing people left and right. So I think there will be backlash from that once the politicians start to lose their jobs. Yes. And that's the, that's the way it's been for the past 20 years. You know, every time the Fed starts to kind of try and tighten the stock market tanks and, and uh, all that political pressure forces the Fed to go back to easing. Um, which is why stocks aren't much lower than they are right now, because people have been conditioned to buy the dip and expect the Fed to capitulate pretty quickly as soon as stocks drop by 20 or 30%. Um, but inflation is raging to an extent this time that is keeping the Fed from doing that. So the Fed is going to have to tighten more than they, uh, they have in previous cycles, and the markets are going to have to kind of get used to that, which means stocks probably have to tank. Uh, but having said all that, there still is a point at which the, the political pressure to go back to easing will become overwhelming and the Fed will have to do it. So they'll, the Fed well, will still capitulate, but we just don't know where. Well, also, also, John, there's a math problem here. So the U.S. government wants to keep spending the interest payments on the national debt. The national debt's over $31 trillion. So if they're talking about raising interest rates to 4% or 5% and this debt needs to be rolled over at higher interest rates. I mean, at some point in the not too distant future, I don't know if it's six months, 12 months, 18 months, Uncle Sam's not going to be able to afford the interest payments on larger amounts of national debt at 4% and 5%. The math just doesn't work with the tax revenues we have and without inflate, reinflating asset prices if they do crash home prices. You know, the states and local governments, their finances could collapse six, nine, 12 months from now, if if real estate across the country here in the United States collapses, John, I mean, it was panic and chaos in 2008 and nine. The US Treasury, I think their tax receipts collapsed by about 30% in a very short amount of time. That was one of the major reasons why the Fed did quantitative easing. One of the real reasons was to plug the hole in the finance gap for government. Yeah, um, and, and the US, is the least of the world's problems in this case. It, it, the U.S. Um, government's interest costs would definitely soar if interest rates go up, but some other places would have it much harder. You know, Japan is just a nightmare. Their government is more indebted on a per capita basis than any other government in human history. So if their interest rates on that government debt just go up to what the U.S. rates are, um, Japan's government would be bankrupt. And, I don't even uh, think Japan can afford 1%. A full, I don't even think they can afford a full 1%. I think I saw the math. Yeah, yeah, it's it's shocking. And they've only been able to get away with it because they had negative interest rates, which means the more money they borrow, the less, wait, the more money they borrow, the smaller their deficit becomes, the smaller their interest costs become because um, they're getting paid to issue debt. Now, now that their interest rates are positive, in other words, they have to pay interest on their debt. Um, it's not far from here where people start talking about bankruptcy for them and the yen collapses, you know, and, and Europe's got a lot of the same problems because their debts are outrageous. And, you know, almost the only country that's not in this boat is Russia. They, they've kept their debt under control. Yeah. And all these countries you mentioned, John, they're not buying U.S. treasuries anymore because most of them are not running enormous trade surpluses. And even if they are running enormous trade surpluses, they're not reinvesting those trade surpluses and their foreign exchange reserves into U.S. treasuries. <laughs> and there, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that they're, they don't like the U.S., a lot of other countries, because we, we really abuse the privilege and the power that comes with having the world's reserve currency. So we antagonize everybody else. And uh, if they don't have to own treasuries, they, they don't so much. So, you know, you're, you're watching probably the, the BRICS countries form a separate monetary union out there. In other words, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China are forming a competing monetary system that won't necessarily use dollars. And they're able, because they've been accumulating gold and silver for such a long time, they're able to back whatever currency they decide to use with precious metals, which will make it look way uh, stronger than the U.S. dollar. 
when the time comes. So, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of adjustments being made out there to a changing world, and most of them are negative for the U.S. dollar. But, um, but yeah, just rising interest rates will blow everything up because um, it's not just governments. Um, people have adjustable rate mortgages and credit cards, and there's a lot of business loans out there that are, you know, prime plus two or whatever, and those things go with, go up with interest rates. So you would see a lot of um, people going bust if interest rates rise to historically normal levels, like six or seven percent for, you know, middle of the yield curve in the U.S. Yeah, we um, that that would be catastrophic. We can't go back there again. And see, th- this will be the uh, the big phase change in market psychology when the Fed has to capitulate before getting to those interest rate levels and everybody realizing, oh, we can never go back to a normal financial system again. It's always going to be massive government deficits, um, insane money creation from all the big central banks, all kinds of financial manipulation everywhere you look, bailouts every year. You know, that's the new normal. And they just don't want to play anymore. You know, so that's it's another definition of the crack up boom when people just decide, okay, I don't want to be part of of this madness anymore. And they pile into real assets. So that's the um, the gold story basically. You know, everybody's gonna be jumping into precious metals when this happens. And uh, you want to be there ahead of the uh, the hordes of desperate people. Do you think deflation can be allowed for a long period of time in a debt-based fiat currency system? No. no. Deflation is a sign of a healthy society. In other words, we're more productive each year. Therefore, the uh, the cost of what we make goes down a little bit each year. And and uh, that's, that's a healthy society. But an over-indebted society um, cannot have that happening because they've got to pay off lots of debt. The, the participants in, a, in an over-leveraged society. Uh, and they need the currency that they're using to pay off that debt to go down in value a little bit. In other words, they need prices of what they're selling to go up, um, which allows them to pay off their debts. But if uh, if the currency gets a little stronger each year and prices go down a little bit each year, that's a disaster for heavily indebted um players in the financial system and in well, the uh, the business community. And well, so, yeah, you, you, you can't have deflation in an over-leveraged system or that blows it up. And this is part of the problem we have now with the cross-current. So we have a lot of stagflation in all these different countries, but we also have the dollar rising. So when the dollar was weak, what, 12 months ago, you had all these emerging market countries, these emerging market corporations, they borrowed more in dollars. So you knew that the dollar was going to rally when the dollar was weak because they took out more dollar than I made debt, I think a record amount in 2021, and they were going to need more dollars to either service or pay off that debt. So you knew at some point this thing has been going on in a cycle for the last 8, 10, 15 years, really since 2008. We've had the dollar index in a trading range that every time it gets weak, these foreign governments and foreign companies just borrow more dollars and then the dollar rallies. And then we get a crisis similar to this, although now we have stagflation thrown in and supply chain problems. So it's even worse for emerging markets. Oh, yeah, this is orders of more magnitude worse than 2008, 2009. You know, when the housing bubble burst, uh, most of the rest of the global financial system was in halfway decent shape. And now pretty much everybody's a mess. <laughs> you know, there are very few success stories out there and a whole lot of um, landmines waiting to be stepped on and, and blow up. Um, so, yeah, the, the next few years ought to be a lot more chaotic than um, the Great Recession was. And it was pretty chaotic. That was a really scary time. So... What's coming now is going to be a lot worse. And it's potentially the end of the system. You know, the whole fiat currency, fractional reserve banking, you know, governments taking on more and more debt year after year. That that whole system um, is unworkable. And the mess that we're making right this minute could cause the crisis that basically ends this whole system. Um, there, there's no guarantee that we can't pull some kind of a massive financial rabbit out of the hat one more time. But, but I think it's also possible that, uh, that this is the breakdown that we're looking at in the system that has been in place for all of our adult lives. You know, and we're going to have to come up with something else that's new. And 
a lot of it's a derivatives market. It's just so big, hundreds of trillions or a quadrillion, depending upon how you measure it. So there's these bank failures now every two to five years because these banks are gambling in the derivatives market and hedge funds are doing it. In 2019, uh, 2018, 2019, they borrowed from the repo market and their bets on currencies and their over leveraged bets on currencies, bonds, derivatives, those blew up. And they just take out too many dollars and they the gamble uh, the gambling is just way too much. And then we always have now, it seems, a crisis every two to five years because of the total size of debt in the system. I was going to bring up the numbers of debt. I, I, I've been friends with you for many, many years interviewing you. In what, 2008, 2009, the total debt for governments and corporations was around, what, $200 trillion, I think, officially. And now here we are about 15 years later. It's over 300 trillion. So, I mean, they've grown the debt by tens of trillions, almost 100 trillion total in additional debt that was added. Well, were new products and services created? Was new cash flow created to pay off the debt? It doesn't make a lot of sense to keep growing the debt at the levels that it has been for government and corporate debt for all these years. Yeah. Um, we basically. Um... In 2008, 2009, we were like a, a family where the, the breadwinners lose their job. And instead of cutting back, they just um, kept their same lifestyle, but put it all on credit cards, maxed out a whole bunch of credit cards, you know. And so they get their jobs back, but now they've got an extra, you know, half a million dollars of credit card debt just waiting to jump up to 21% as soon as they miss a payment. Um, and that's basically what the world is like right now you know we didn't fix anything after we didn't fix anything after the dot-com bubble blew up in um, 2000 and then we absolutely didn't fix anything after the real estate bubble burst in um, 2007 or so and so we've just got uh, much much bigger problems now with no solutions and that's where we are but um you know I don't want to leave this on such a depressing, depressing note, you know, because <laughs> the, uh, this is all the stuff we're talking about right now is basically an investment thesis. You know, all this stuff is happening in the world. We've got all these problems. These problems will, uh, will manifest as X, Y, and Z. Uh, and, and, but the next part of that thought process is how do you make money from it? You know, how can we be among the people who, um, who are like the guys in that, the movie, The Big Short, you know, who do exactly the right thing, even though nobody else sees it, and who make a fortune and who have the capital to actually do good things going forward after that. You know, that should be our goal. And I think there are a few things that um, they are starting to look more and more obvious. And one is um, selective shorts. You know, if you're if, if you're betting against some of these overvalued stocks that are out there right now, because the Fed is going to tighten, it's going to surprise the markets by tightening more than they've been expecting. And that should make stocks go down. You know, there's money to be made in short. Um, there's also um, precious metals, which will tend to do really well at the bottom when the Fed finally does capitulate. And and uh, maybe people finally figure out that that's it for these fiat currencies. You know, they're never going to be saved. And, and uh, you don't want any part of the dollar and the euro and the yen going forward. You know, and people are going to want to buy gold and silver at that point. And they're going to do it in a, in a panicked way because... Those markets are tiny compared to the amount of investable capital that exists in the world right now. So let one or two percent um, of what's out there right now try to flow into gold and silver, and uh, you won't even be able to get that stuff then. So you you kind of want to lock down your precious metals positions ahead of time, even if you have to wait a few years. Uh, although you might not have to, but um, when the time comes, like, like Jim Rickards has this uh, this story that he tells about his clients who say, yeah, yeah, Jim, I, I get all this this crisis stuff is coming. So call me right before the crisis hits and then I'll buy gold and silver and stuff like that. And, and you know, his response is right before the crisis hits, you won't be able to get anything. You know, it, it, you need to do it much sooner. And so that's kind of what we should be doing now. We should be preparing for this big crisis. Um, even if it's not going to happen right away. And then, you know, real or, or um, well-chosen real estate, like a good rental house or a piece of um, farmland or something like that, those things will tend to do really well in what's coming also. And it looks like uranium, you know, the whole energy crisis is kind of playing into, um, into nuclear power's hands right now. You know, it's everybody's going back to the to nuclear, they're restarting the nuclear plants, and there's nowhere near enough uranium to uh, 
um, to power all those plants. So that means the price of uranium has to go up. So besides gold and silver, that's another mining, part of the mining sector that might do really well going forward. A lot of these gold stocks are at 52-week lows. Some of them are still having really good profit margins or paying dividends. You have to be very careful, though, selective, because just because a company was good in the past, the miner can have a lot of problems. Pan American Silver had a really bad quarter recently, even though historically they were one of the lowest cost producers. They've had some really bad problems the last couple quarters that may take a long time to get fixed. So owning individual mining stocks is risky. There's mining stock ETFs. But to add to your points there, I, I think a investable trend we talked about a lot of bad news in the global economy, um, a lot of problems based on government and central bank policies. But I think an investable trend is the food and energy crisis. So like natural gas, I've been rec I've been um, writing research articles about uh, long term bullish on natural gas for two years now when natural gas was cheap, predicting a lot of the stuff that's happening. So natural gas, I think, has a long term bull market. Uranium, I think, has a long term bull market. Even these fertilizer stocks, because I was speaking with farmers after I interviewed Doomberg the first time five months ago, and they were telling me they skipped planting season and didn't order fertilizer because it was too expensive. They're going to reorder fertilizer, John, and they're going to plant more more crops, especially at higher prices with so many of these emerging markets having food shortages. So I think these are all investable trends for people that they can uh, take advantage of. And because of the policies from governments, uh, politicians, bureaucrats, regulators, I don't think the food and energy crisis is going to end anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and that, that creates a lot of opportunities. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not as confident um, buying food related stocks as um, energy and precious metals, but there, there will be a lot of winners in that space. And if you have some expertise, um, that, that's another place where you can uh, put together a portfolio of companies that are really well suited for what's coming. So, so yeah, this is, um, you know, it sounds like it's, it's just this horrible story of uh, failure here and failure everywhere else. Uh, but um, it's actually uh, kind of, exciting because there are some extraordinary opportunities out there and there will be people who make life-changing fortunes by calling it correctly so i you know that's that's how you um that's how you exist in uh an incipient crisis without being driven crazy by it you look for the opportunities and you let that energize you and that's i, I think the, the healthiest way to approach something like this yeah, I agree. There's definitely opportunity in crisis. I think the Chinese, even their their character for crisis, I think, is the same character in Mandarin for opportunity. So I think they understood this in their own in their uh, directly in their language. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that really is just basically common sense. Anybody who's watched markets for um, for very long at all knows that uh, when something is tanking, something else is going up. And uh, you just want to find the things that are most likely to go up. And, and uh, you know, cycles, they're hard to understand why you're in them. But if you step back a little bit and look at these long waves that have happened in human history, um, they, they become a lot more understandable. And any kind of a long wave analysis, and there are several different schools of thought um, on that topic, they all say pretty much the same thing, that we're basically screwed right now. <laughs> you know, and the people who did the old um, the old things, you know, the things that made money for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, however long the cycle has been going, uh, they're the ones who are going to get creamed. And the people who do the opposite, in other words, bet against the system that has been in place for such a long time, they tend to do very well. So... We just need to be those people, you know, the ones who bet against the system. And I think we'll be okay. Well, one of my favorite investors all time is Sir John Templeton. So he's looking for the point of maximum pessimism. He's looking um, to gauge sentiment and then to buy low and sell high. So he's looking for blood in the streets, companies that are still making money that are absolutely hated. And I think, you know, so a lot of these resource stocks, maybe not the oil companies or the natural gas producers, but a lot of these companies are still making pretty good money right now even though energy prices are up and metals prices are down. So it's which ones are going to survive, especially not just the gold miners. We were talking about this before we started recording. If you go back and look at the max charts and the deals that the larger precious metal royalty and streaming companies have done, like Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metals, Royal Gold, they've done a lot of deals in market conditions similar to this in 2008, 2009, 2015, 2016, during bear markets when metals prices were crashing, when miners couldn't get capital, when juniors needed um, 
a few million bucks to go do a drilling program. They went and bought a royalty, and then eventually that became a mine and it cash flowed. Yeah, if you look at the um, the price charts of the big royalty stocks in the precious metal space, they're they're the ones who basically finance um, new gold mines and then take a cut of the eventual output. Uh, it's a really good stable business model. But if you look at them right now, it looks like they're having a hard time. Their stocks are down, um, and they're they're not putting up the great numbers they put up fairly recently. But this is the part of their cycle when they really do the most interesting things, because this is the chance that, uh, you know, for, for two or three years out of each 10-year cycle, um, the junior miners are desperate enough to do deals on the royalty company's terms. And we're heading back into that time now where a lot of junior miners are seriously desperate for financing. And that means the um, the, the big royalty companies are going to get some really good profitable deals and that will generate lots of cash flow for them going forward. So yeah, the uh, the big royalty companies like uh, Royal Gold and uh, Wheat and Precious Metals and Franco Nevada, those guys are probably the best um, stocks to own right now of everything because they're not only will they do very well in, in the coming cycle, but um, they're pretty safe. You know, they are not going to go bankrupt. They have zero bankruptcy risk or virtually zero. Um, and that's more than can be said for companies in almost any other space right now. Yeah, I agree. And I've interviewed Nolan Watson, CEO of Sandstrom Gold many times, but I've also spoken with executives at those other companies, listened to the conference calls. These executives at the larger royalty and streaming companies, their share prices might be down now, but they actually love these bear market conditions because the phone's ringing off the hook for potential new deals. They're getting emails. They're getting all these deals brought to them that they would not have gotten brought to them when metals prices were higher because the terms are were not as good back then when metals prices were higher because all sources of capital are available. So they're the kind of the only game in town right now. And their cost of capital is cheaper. They still have really good profit margins and free cash flow. So they have all these deals available to pick and choose from. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I think really if, uh, if your listeners just do one thing <laughs> to prepare for what's coming, uh, grabbing some of these, um, these streamer royalty company stocks um, would probably be the simplest, best thing to do. And they might not pay off right away, but you're getting paid a dividend. And from history, going back and looking at prior metals bear markets and commodities bear markets, these companies have done very, very well during the bear cycles as they grow two, three, four, five years later with the growth and the deals that they did in the bear market because they can actually be contrarians. And that's the key with commodities. If you if you speak to Rick Rule and other successful commodities investors, is the contrarian investors in the commodity sectors that ac actually end up doing very well a couple of years later because they invest in the bear market and then the cycle turns and then they make a lot of money. Yes, and, and the, the royalty companies are kind of designed to be contrarian because they, they can only really justify deals when they're extremely cheap. And that only happens at the bottom of each cycle. So, um, so yes, this this is a good time for these guys. Uh, I, I think they, uh, I'm, I'm sure they continue to find ways to work the executives running these companies through the whole cycle. But I think this is when they do most of their productive work, and I think they kind of kick back and just enjoy the cash flows for the the other seven or eight years out of each ten year cycle. Exactly, they actually get the best terms. So their internal rate of return, their return on invested capital improves in these bear market conditions. Whereas when the metals prices are higher, they're bidding against a lot of other sources of capital. They're mostly just bidding to bring higher cost new mines online. So uh, stream financing with a higher cost of potential new mine that may not be economic at a lower metals price. Yes, totally agree. So, John, I really enjoyed our discussion today. If my listeners want to take a look at your books, they're available on audiobook and then also your website, Dollar Collapse. How do they do so? Well, I uh, I don't run dollarcollapse.com anymore. I recently sold it. But the guys who are running it are doing a great job. So, you know, my advice would be the same as back when I was plugging that site. It's going, you know, go there, put your email address in the join our email list box, and you'll just get whatever um, those guys publish free and it's mostly what we talk about you know it's a kind of a steady stream of uh, of news and commentary on the uh, the dark side of the financial world and uh how do they buy your books oh books are at amazon or any other bookseller they're um they're very easy to find and buy 
and I recommend reading The Money Bubble. I think it was a very good book. You talk about the currency swap lines there, the problems with all these fiat currencies, because even though the dollar is strong right now, all these fiat currencies, there are big, big problems with all of them. China's printing like crazy inside China. They have crazy amounts of capital controls. The Japanese yen is a total disaster now, especially with their energy imports and higher interest rates. So all these currencies are sick. Yeah, you know, it is funny. With, with investment books, timing is everything. Because if you're bringing out something that has advice in it, you want that advice to correspond to what's happening in the world. And the money bubble was way early. Um, that that book came out in 2014, 2015. And the predictions it made are only now coming true. So it's it's a, a funny case of a, a slightly older book that's actually timely. <laughs> Because <laughs> all that stuff is just finally happening. So, yeah, I, I think that, that would be a useful primer on um, on the world as it is today. John, I would argue that it just looks early, but that the Fed was able with the Cantillon effect and asset price inflation, they were able to paper over and fool so many people for so many years. The Chinese government was also doing all this infrastructure spending. The Chinese government was bailing out banks and printing like crazy for so many years and buying, doing natural resource deals all over the globe with their own currency. So all these governments are, especially the larger ones like the U.S. and China, have just done crazy amounts of rules changes and manipulations and currency printing. They just got away with it for years, many years longer than a lot of people like you and James Turk when you wrote books like that thought they would. Yeah. Um, a printing press is a phenomenal tool for fooling people and making, making people think things are better than they are. Uh, but it's not a permanent tool. You know, eventually um, it runs out of the ability to keep fooling people. And that's where we all today are today. People are figuring it out. And uh, that's going to be a very big deal in financial history. Exactly. Look at how many people are actually uh, Google searching inflation, stagflation. You have people now paying attention to the economy here in the U.S. It's going to be a major voting issue. The voter is paying a lot of attention to the economy, inflation, gasoline prices. I mean, th these were not as big issues in the past. And now the voters paying attention. So if politicians lose their jobs, that normally means uh, more pressure on the Fed to switch things up and reverse course. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Enjoyed it.